I'd like to say good morning to everyone and again welcome for coming along. Thank you for coming out in um, uncertain times like this with COVID. We really appreciate you doing that and um, uh, I'd like to um, say a big thanks from Anscar for doing that. I'm sure you're in for a lovely morning. Kerry and I just love doing these kind of um, trips. All right, now in your welcome teachers pack, you've got a syllabus. That's a free syllabus and it'll be keyboard, piano keyboard for the majority of you. If you turn to page three, I'll just walk you through the syllabus because that way you can make, you know, do um, pencil markings on it or whatever you like. That's your syllabus to keep. It is also available online if you want to go and do it on your iPad or whatever. You don't want a book in your hand. I mean, I prefer a book. Kerry enjoys using her iPad, don't you? So each to their own. Now, it's got all the contacts on that front page at page three. The only thing you have to take note of is the email address you have to put a .au on the end of it. So it reads admin at anscar.com.au. If you could change that, because by the dates on the book, this goes from 2018 to 2020, but our headquarters are in Melbourne. And of course, those poor darlings have been in lockdown for, I think there were seven months in lockdown and working from home. And um, in our office, headquarters and office, we have four staff there's other people who are involved in ANSCAR but they work from home and, and do different jobs but actually in the offices for staff and they couldn't go into the office of course to do any printing or anything like that. Um, and then finally when the restrictions were lifted and they were allowed to travel into the office they were allowed 25% of their office staff. That means one person could go in so that's why we're a little bit behind with covers and up-to-date stuff you know, like that with dates. So just bear with them. They're back after a well-earned two weeks break and they're launching into it down there to bring us everything we need. Um, the other thing, mm, no, can't see it, um, is a handbook that normally comes out uh, in January and everyone gets a handbook. If you're one of the registered teachers, everyone gets a handbook and it's got any of the changes in it for the year to you know, give you a heads up so you don't have to go trawling through the syllabus. Um, and it's got a lot of information at the back, right at the back, like um, the dates for exams and the costing of the exams and any of the requirements. So that gets sent to you automatically. And can I crowd across mm. you there, Cynthia? As well as getting the physical handbook, if you're like me, often you'll put something down and go, where on earth did I put it? You can also get it online. So go into the ANSCA website and look up ANSCA handbook and all of that handbook is in digital copy as well for those of you who prefer digital as I do. Mm. Thanks, Kerry. Okay, so let me walk you quickly through this. Um, the next page four has the local representatives on it. I'm actually down in this book as the Whitsunday Bowen area rep, but I'm actually Queensland representative now. I've been representative for ANSCAR in the Mackay and District region for probably about oh, 30 years. And then I was asked to be Queensland state rep about three or four years ago. And so I, um, Janet Jackson was put on in my place in Mackay and now Helen Sedman, who's not listed there, is taking care of the Whitsunday area for us so I can concentrate on being the state rep. And then over, come across to page five, you'll see a list of examiners that examine for ANSCAR and Kerry will tell you a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but you'll, if you run your eye down the Queensland one, um, I'm listed there, Kerry's towards the end, alphabetical order. And right, so then let's keep going over. Um, oh, but, and our phone numbers are at the front. So you can ring us anytime you like. If we're awake, we'll answer the phone. If we're not teaching, we'll be able to talk to you straight away. And um, we're only an email or a phone call or a you know, FaceTime call away. So you can ring us any, anytime you like with questions. Uh, right, okay. Just as, as a walkthrough, because it's hard when you've got to get yourself around a new syllabus. The first part is theory, and that's in any syllabus with any instrument 
the theory is in the first part because you have to do theory and it's the same theory whether you're learning a violin or you're doing piano or you're doing guitar or singing it's the same theory and so again I'll talk to you a little bit more about that if you keep coming across it's got 20 general information all about the technical work and um, you know if you're going to do the digital keyboard exam what sort of keyboard you've got to have and uh, about the improvisation oral tests which are page 25 and then the general knowledge and we'll come back to that because it's got something special in that and then we come over and across to page 34 which has got the digital keyboard exam and Kerry will speak to you about that one. Now we wanted to go through the digital syllabus for the keyboard in a bit more detail because we found a lot of teachers are having a bit of confusion with this. Not everyone, but when we go through it you'll see why there's confusion. Cynthia will be talking to the modern syllabus as soon as I've finished with the digital. And there's so much similarity in the digital that it's easy to get them confused. So our introductory exam is the same for all of the grades. Shall I quickly talk to the introductory while I'm here? Uh, yeah. Yep. So our introductory book looks like this. And for years I didn't put people in for introductory. And the year before last I had a grade 8 who wanted to sit out of period and I'll come to talk to about having the exams in your own home but I always try and do the right thing and get the three hours so I went you know what all my littlies are going to do introductory and I would like to tell you and Mary Jane's little one did introductory last year and loved it and now I do it with all my littlies but this little girl was called Chloe she'd had lessons for four weeks and it was time to put the exam entry in Chloe was a nightmare and she had her parents run ragged. The mum by week five was too frightened to come into the piano lesson, too stressed. Dad, who was a university lecturer, was sitting on the floor behind Chloe's piano stool weeping and sobbing and I said, if you had a little puppy, would you let it run rings around you and tear your furniture? Chloe's not the boss of your house, here's a news flash. Chloe, would you like to be very grown up and do an exam? Because I could see this child needed a bit of focus. And she goes, yes, I want to do exam. So we put her on this. Now, some of the pieces are super easy. The ones that we hear in the exam room a lot, for instance, are little waltz. You can see how very easy little waltz is. Then it goes to a much harder idea which is the leaping frogs here and leaping frogs <coughs> excuse me leaping frogs is an a minor and has all of this cross hand work what i encourage the children to do is after we've chosen our two pieces you only need two pieces one in triple one in quadruple I say, see how many of these you can learn before the exam, so that when you get to the exam, the examiner's turning the pages in your book going, wow, look at all these stickers. Haven't you done well? It is a really good jumping off point for the little ears, and it's designed to be in the first grade of their first year of their piano studies. Now, we have introductory and preparatory. You'll see on page 34 we have preparatory in the digital piano and most exam boards start at preliminary and the preparatory was introduced because ANSCO exams are fun. Kids come out going when can I do the next one? That was so much fun and we found the second child in the family was going but I want to do an exam too that was so much fun. So we introduced preparatory. Guess what? Third sibling in the family is going well what about me? I want to do one too. So we introduced the introductory, which is for first year of piano studies. Now, coming out to the digital piano, let's look at some of the differences. List A is a single line melody with chord symbols. Now, when I first encountered the digital piano, I was a bit resistant. I had not taught it. I mainly taught acoustic piano. And I thought, oh, this is going to be awful but the kids love it. They come in with their little faces shining and they think they are the bee's knees. Because how many of us have children who come to their first piano lesson 
and the instrument at home is a digital keyboard because mum and dad want to see are they going to really like it and then we'll invest in a piano. So the whole idea of this syllabus is to let the children use their keyboard as a keyboard and use the functions that it has. So if you can see in list A on page 34, it's a single line melody with chord symbols. Already we're teaching them how to use a lead sheet, which I think is phenomenal. And the rhythm unit must be used, which means they're getting to use their keyboard as a keyboard with all the bells and whistles. Now this is where the confusion comes in. List B is anything from the modern piano syllabus and you play it as if it was a modern piano piece. So the left hand is as written and you are not allowed to use the rhythm unit. Then list C can be either another list A but this time we have to embellish and this is so you get lead sheet, rhythm unit, modern piece, lead sheet, rhythm unit and embellishment because Cynthia will talk to the improvisation and the embellishment that is needed for the modern syllabus and it doesn't become mandatory until grade three but we really encourage them from the lower grades and in the digital keyboard syllabus in the third piece the list C you must do some embellishment. Now that can be so difficult it can be my piece finished on a C and I add the C below. There's your embellishment done. At this grade level, it doesn't have to be terrifying. Even one note will count as an embellishment. Looking at the preliminary, and I will start to sound like a broken record, list A is again a single melody with chord symbols. So they need to know their triads, and a lot of method books will teach the basic chords one, four, and five, seven. And at the little level, you could do you could even minimise the chords, but they must do some form of that left hand. We're using a lead sheet and the rhythm unit must be used. For list B, they're more specific now at preliminary level and we use the blues category. And again, must play the left hand as written, no rhythm unit, so it's just like a list B modern piece. Now at list C, you now get a choice. You can do another list A with the embellishment or you can choose a solo from the modern syllabus, pop and rock and boogie. Can you see why it gets confusing? If you read the syllabus and keep referring back to it, you can't go wrong. But I think a lot of teachers in the past have been winging it and going, oh yeah, I know what to do. And that's when we have problems in the exam room. At grade one level, again, single line melody for list A with chord symbols and using the rhythm unit. List B can now come from the blues or the boogie and list C again can be the same as list A but you must embellish or a solo from pop and rock or ragtime now. And there's also a free choice that starts at grade one. We love Anska because there is so much choice and the free choice means you can choose something from list A, B or C. At grade two level, again, list A hasn't changed, single line melody with chord symbols. Obviously our chords could get more advanced as the grades go up and you must use the rhythm unit. List B is now boogie or blues, played straight as a modern piece. And list C is again a list A, but with embellishment. At, or you can use pop and rock and now you can use ragtime or you can have a free choice for either list A, B or C, but it must conform to the specifications of those lists. At grade three, guess what? Single line melody. It, we're doing a chord with a single line lead sheet again, but now at grade three, you must have an introduction and you must use embellishment in this list A. Or, you could do a ragtime and jazz and popular standards instead. And in that case, the rhythm unit is optional. For list B, you can again do boogie and blues, and now the rhythm unit is optional. Remember earlier, list B, you weren't allowed to use the rhythm unit. It's now optional. 
and list C is again list A with embellishment or pop and rock and at this grade level we introduce Latin American and that free choice is still there for either list A, B or C. Grade 4 is the first grade with Ansgar that you do four pieces and it never gets to be more than four pieces and we'll talk about that later why we love that so much. So four pieces and it says up the top under the notes on the list one must contain embellishment so it can be an introduction, it can be a coda, harmony notes, change of the rhythm. List A, guess what? It's a lead sheet again and you have to have an introduction and you must use embellishment or you could choose ragtime and jazz and popular standards from the modern list, rhythm unit being optional. Notice that if you did it from the modern you can have backing tracks but here because it's digital piano they're asking you to use the rhythm unit that is included on their digital keyboard. List B is again boogie or blues as written from the modern syllabus and the rhythm unit is again optional. And list C can be from list A with embellishment and rhythm unit or again it could be pop and rock or Latin American. And list D, which is our new list at this grade, is any piece of grade four in either classical or modern. So it could be another one of the digital keyboard ones, it could be something from the classical list, it could be something from the modern list. And I will hand over to Cynthia to talk about the modern. Okay, so you can find your uh, modern starting on 42, page 42, and again you can use this lovely little introductory book. Um, I just might take you through that a little bit at the beginning. Everything's contained within the book and so you have the scales at the front, the little five finger exercise scales and you've got the little triads down the bottom that match. And then the book splits into two so at the beginning you've got triple time and then halfway through it becomes quadruple time 4-4 four, four. and so they're asked to do one piece out of each side that's all just two pieces for this level and there's no um, embellishment or anything like that required although it's always best to start that embellishment early I, when my children do this when my students do this they always embellish it just a little bit like I had a little um, cherub do chimes Wherever that is, chimes would help to look at the. Okay, page eight. So you can have a look at this. See this little piece here? And she's so cute. And she um, she's so tiny because she was she was actually in uh, kindy. She she's in kindy. She's in grade no, she's not she's in grade one this year, so no prep, beg your pardon, this year. And she did this when she was in kindy last year and she couldn't reach the pedals of course so I've got a pedal extender and we set her up with that and she played all the way through beautifully and then I got her to repeat it an octave or two octaves higher it depends on how she felt on the day how she'd like to do it and we put the um, you know the damper pedal on and oh she, it was a million dollars it just sort of like floated off like chimes would and then we did this little ending just like repeat the ending so it um, it, it actually it was so pretty and you know we did the hands off it just looked so cool she she loved it and um, so that's just a little bit that you can do you don't have to do masses of it but if you start early it's not so scary when you come to grade three or four where you have to do it it's mandatory to do it and Kerry later on will take you through the jazz syllabus which has embellishment and improvisation and she's coming from a classical background so that you know how easy is it how easy is it she's just going to show you how easy it is because most teachers classical trained teachers when they, they desperately would love to teach the modern because it really attracts students um, one of our little titles on our flyer if you saw it was five ways to attract and retain students and Modern works is the way to go because they just want to play their stuff. They hear it on TV or they've got it on their games on the computer or they've gone to a movie and they want to do that. 
well, you know, you need to be a bit flexible and be able to produce that for them and to work with them on that. Uh, so, okay, so at the back, once you've done two pieces, you come across and at the back you've got a little general knowledge page. Now what I do, I photocopy that off for my students and we go through the pieces and we highlight anything that's in their piece because they only have to know for general knowledge what's in their piece. If they, if they haven't got a dotted minimum in their piece, they don't need to know what that is. The examiner's not going to sort of pluck something out of the air. It's got to be within their piece and so that it's all there. Now it says, for example, um, a minimum or half note. Either answer will be accepted. We predominantly use um, minimum, but if they learn half note, that's fine too. And then over here is the little test, little sample tests for oral. They don't do sight reading at this level. And at this level, it's the only level that ANSCAR don't give marks on. Um, 85. Apart from diploma. Apart from diploma. So you've got, um, you've got, for, um, sorry, for this one, normally, normally, in the other grades, you have 95 and above is first class honours, which is A plus, and then you've got um, 85 to 94 is honours and so forth and so on. So for this grade, if they get an honour pass, you know that they've got 85 and above. You just don't know the number for this grade, but the other grades um, actually do attract that. Now, preparatory level. Okay, this is marked as are the other grades and they've got 85, 95 and above is A+, plus, which is first class honours, 85 and above A, 75 and above is credit or B and then 60 is the pass for a pass, not 65. And Kerry, can you speak to that um, where you're saying, you know, yesterday if it gets, if the student yes. gets 59. So sometimes there'll be a student in other boards 65 is a pass. We like to make it 60 because we will come later to talk about how we like to encourage the younger ones. And if you make it 60, that's sort of almost like at university a three is a pass conceded. So 60 to 65, it sends a message to both the teacher and the student saying, well, we passed you, but you could do a bit better. And occasionally with the little ones, we try really hard never to fail a small one. You've got to be doing something really bad to fail a small child. If they're really not quite at the standard, we can give them 59 and a half. Now that technically is a fail, which sends a message to the student and the teacher saying, you make sure you work harder for the next grade, but the computer in the office will round up the 59 and a half and it will become 60. So the child will pass. Mm. Mm. Okay, so thanks, Kerry. So in the in in the, uh, introductory, preparatory, preliminary, and grade one, if you buy the ANSCAR book, it's all contained within the book. The scales are there, and that's what's required. Or you can do option two, which is like um, you know when you're trying to get veggies into kids, and they go, I don't like broccoli, or I don't like the potato or pumpkin or whatever it is and you kind of sneak it into you know casseroles or patties or something like that um, and you know they eat it but it's like this I don't like playing scales that's okay do option two and what it is is little pieces and they've got the scales in them awesome so they're actually doing scales when they don't realize it and the other thing with the option two is you don't have to play them by memory scales have to be by memory but option two doesn't have to be and then in the preparatory Um, and in the manual list in the syllabus, with this particular one, there's no categories. You can see that they are a boogie and a, a boogie or a blues or a pop and rock, but it's actually not in a category for preparatory. So when you choose three pieces from preparatory, you can take them out of the list in the syllabus or you can take them out of the book. It doesn't matter. You can mix, mix and match across. You're not. Um, you're not sort of confined to the book if you buy the book. Um, you can choose one or two out of there and one out of here. It's all good. Right, so going on to, uh, and uh, sorry, at the back, at the back you've got a little example of the sight reading that would they'd encounter in the exam room and the oral tests. So that's all in the book. 
it's very good value. And then you've got uh, the prelim is the same and the grade one is the same. Now, it's grade two I want to talk about. In grade two, they don't have the scales at the front of the book. So it's a good idea to purchase the technical workbook. Now there's one for guitar as well. There's, and um, this is for the keyboard and piano. There's one for singing. There's one for drums. There's one for drums, yeah. So, you know, they're there. That's, that's your kind of friend. Make sure that you've got one of these because if you're doing modern stream later down the track, they also bring in the blues scales and the modes for modern stream students. And, you know, it's all in here. So as long as you're referring to your syllabus, make sure you check your syllabus and then go across and make sure, don't just pick it up and go, oh, they're grade two, that's the scales. Just double check in case there's been any changes, but that's, um, that's an awesome book to have. So they do the scales and they have to choose three pieces. Now, if you have a look at the syllabus, grade two is on page 50. And it says technical work, which is worth 20 marks. And then just down a bit further, it says list, 18 marks each. Two solos to be selected from two of the following categories and one free choice piece, three pieces in all. Now that free choice piece actually kicks in at grade one. It actually kicks in at grade one. So they do two pieces plus a free short choice. The reason I've jumped to grade two is this. When they have the categories, you've got pop and rock. Over the page you've got blues, then you've got boogie and ragtime. So you have to choose two pieces from two different categories. Make sure they're two different categories and then they have a free choice piece. Now that free choice piece, this is why Kerry and I absolutely love Anscart. They're so flexible. You can choose that free choice piece from anywhere in the modern syllabus. We're assuming you're doing a modern exam. But if you want to, choose a classical piece for them out of the classical syllabus which is at the back you can go across there to the grade two and choose from out of there but you can also choose something that's out there in the community in another exam uh, syllabus if you want to um, if kids come along with I would like to learn this piece I would like to learn this piece that's fine as long as that's the level of a grade two you're fine if you're a composer teacher we had a question the other day, um, someone said if we took something that was a little bit easier and as a teacher rearranged it so it was grade two standard, would we be able to use that? And I said yes, as long as it, once it, the finished product, when they play it on the piano, is a grade two standard, it's all good from where you'd like to get it. So it's got so much free, you know, you've got so much freedom in choosing things. And then they've got sight reading or improvisation. See down there on page 53, sight reading or improvisation oral test general knowledge. Now what they mean by improvisation is this. Now if you're doing right, if you're doing grade 2 sight reading modern that's what it looks like. Do you see that's what it looks like? And as an examiner for NSCAR, let me tell you, if your kids can read this fluently, they will do fine in the exam, right? They're not these pieces, of course, but the standard is exactly that. So it won't be a problem. Or the, <coughs> the sight reading for classical, if you're going down the classic line, is that one there. Okay, so you can come up and have a look at these later. But this is the book I absolutely adore. When um, did anybody go to the APPC in Brisbane? Yeah, it was good, wasn't it? And we had these books on our stand, and I couldn't keep them up. They just flew off the shelves, and I had to keep ringing the office and saying, "Please send me another lot. Please send me another lot." And this is why, because this is an alternative to sight reading. See how it's a lead sheet and it's got chords on the top of it? Now, as a teacher, I look at that and go, okay, they've got to know the um, G key and the C key and the A minor key. They have to do it, they have to know the chords 
um, in a progression, one, four, five, seven, one, or one, two, five, seven, one, and that's it. They have to learn the, know the chords. But do you know what? I teach them that ahead of time. I send them home and they do, they do the C chord, F, G7, C. And they really like that progression. It's nice, isn't it? So they learn that and I say, okay, we'll try it on G then. So they just, I said, you know, we practice that for a while until it's, you know, they're comfortable with it. And then I just say, shift, to, shift your hand to G and do it again. And so, you see? And it's A minor. And that's it. Except for the one, two, four, five, of course. So once they learn that and they come back and they know it really well, to actually do this and just all they have to do is sight read this little line here, how hard is that for grade two compared to you know the other one I showed you? And of course they go, oh yes, I'll do this. Um, and so all they have to do for this grade and it explains it in the front, there's a CD as well to give you some ideas. This is what they have to do for grade two. Now that's the uh, position I use too for my left hand when I'm teaching students to do it because it's the easiest one it's right under your fingers that's all they have to do they are allowed to go so let me read you the instructions for grade two what to do play the melody with the accompaniment and according to the chord symbols you don't need to add an introduction or coda or embellish the melody you can ghost but not play the notes in each hand before you start Aim to keep a steady tempo right through the piece. So if I was doing that, say I'm, my teacher's taught me all those chords and I know them really well. I'm going to play this in my exam. I, they, they've said, can you please do number two? Not out of this book, they have their own examples. I'm going to do this. Now, before I start, I'm allowed to ghost. Okay, so I'm right. So here we go. Now if I play that, this is what it says on the example page. This is the minimum requirement for grade two. Played evenly and fluently, this will earn you full marks from the examiner. Yes, 10 out of 10. Okay, do you see? And so that's all I have to do. And then when they come to grade three, the requirement for grade three Play the melody with an accompaniment according to the chord symbols, what's new at this level. So it's you know really helping the teacher just hand by hand the hand. The accompaniment must be rhythmic or arpeggiated. So I really like to get value out of this book. I say to the kids when we get to grade two, and you know, all my students have this book. It's if they're not doing an exam for some reason that year, it doesn't matter, they still have this book. We still work with this book. Um, if they're doing classical, you know, stream, we still have this book because it's a standalone book and it's marvellous for, you know, down in the community because you just imagine you can put those chords with Christmas carols. You know, along comes term four and you go, what would you like to do this term? Well, it's the Christmas carol term for me and my students do Christmas carols, either playing written or with lead sheets and knowing the chords or they bring along a piece of their own, of their own choice, you know, that they've got off the internet or we look through the um, internet, they say, I would like to learn, I had a little chap uh, wanting to learn, I'm still standing. He was only in grade one, right? And I went, at that time I didn't know it was Elton John. I Google it up and go, oh, Elton John, okay, <laughs> righto. For a grade one all right, I'm still standing. And you know, I got on the internet, Googled it, got one that was sort of a little bit above his level because you couldn't get something that easy um, at that time. And so he had to aim towards it but that's what he wanted to do along with singing it and he had a voice I won't do it because we're recording but trust me you know when people go they sound like a drone okay he sounded like a drone but I'm 16 years um, teaching in classroom music under my belt and nobody tells me they haven't got a singing voice because I know they have even though it mightn't be you know top operetta but they've got a singing voice and so I helped him find his singing voice over about two or three lessons and he went on to do it in a talent quest at school so you see they this this is all tying in with that it doesn't mean you've got to use it for an exam it's a standalone book if you'd like it to be
So, but I like them to get value for money. So when they come along to do grade three, I go, oh, you know that grade two example you did last year? Let's do it in the grade three style. So it's like this, no introduction or coda needed, just accompaniment. So you've got And they think, oh, this is an easy wicket. When they come to grade four, what's new at this level? The length is now eight bars. Melodic embellishment in the second half of the melody line. Now, if you have a look at it, this is a grade four level. You know, it's got more rhythmic interest. But do you see the first line and the second line is very similar? So, again, we go back to trusty grade two. So I'm getting value for the book and I'm saying play it in the grade 4 style. So I still don't have to add an intro or a coda at this point and for the grade 4 style I usually teach them a stride bass. So we've got grade four style and I did sneak a little ending in there because you know it's a bit abrupt finishing but do you see how I actually got the set the first line and embellished it yeah that's what they're after and five is the same but at this level you've got to do an introduction so that's easy you just ask them to take the little bit at the end you know the you know the seventh chord onwards and just do, maybe play it up an octave higher and then you know go into these and I can do an ending it's just the same thing I actually teach them a fairly standard ending and we do it across all pieces and then I say now you can either use that one or go home and you know do one yourself or listen to other people who play get on the internet and see what they do for an ending and incorporate it and kids love it because they've got to go exploring and looking for themselves most of them really like doing it and there's different keys of course and then oh, I love this we turn to page we turn to grade six and I show them this now they haven't been doing it right from grade two, right, or at a lower level. They look at this and go, oh, I'll do the sight reading, right? Because really, those four bars are sight reading. They are sight reading. And look, they've got a bass style in the bottom. And what you've got to do is you've got to continue it on after that with that same bass style and embellish. So I'll read you what's new. The length of bars is 12. Notated accompaniment for four bars. A coda is required. Begin with a two bar introduction and then play the first line bars one to four as written. Continue the accompaniment style for the remaining eight bars with embellishment in the melody line. Now if they've done that and you've gone right from grade two to do that, it's not a drama. And is anybody familiar with Daniel McFarland um, at all? Is it, yeah? Is anyone not, not know about Daniel? Okay, well you know he's got um, Pop School, Pop School 1 and 2, it's an amazing book, it's like a precursor for this because you can start, this one starts grade 2 level but his works start around about grade 1, high prelim, you know, later prelim and he's got exactly this, a lead sheet and four different bass styles to do to one piece. It just starts off with just normal chords and then double up on the chords and then arpeggiated sort of chords and then the, the fourth example is really quite tricky. But if they've been doing that, as they come into this, this is not anywhere near a drama because they can actually do all that arpeggiated work by the time they get to grade two and wow the socks off the examiner right to do a different style so um, yeah if you want to have a look at this book it'd be amazing now are we improv yes I think we're good mm -hmm. would you like to talk be before I do the jazz would you like to talk about just list the different styles in the modern oh okay yes <coughs> and the other thing is I meant to mention too in Queensland Western Australia and South Australia um, they have points that could go on their senior certificate. You know, here it's the QCE. Is everybody familiar with that? Mm. Yeah, the QCE. Um, <coughs> ANSCAR's works are accepted onto the QCE. You can go into their website 
and see all the things that attract a point or two points, for example. Um, normally it's a grade, well it depends what instrument you're doing. Some are from grade four up, some are from grade six up. Um, the theory is also included in that. There's only two things at the moment that aren't included and one of them is the jazz syllabus and we'll talk about that a bit later. And the other one is the performance syllabus. Can I talk about that now? Okay, the performance syllabus is over on page 138. If you can come across to page 138. This, is, this has been out for several years. I know um, another board bought those out just before COVID, 2019, but I don't think it's, it's similar to this, but not the same. With our performance syllabus, you have to do four pieces, only four. That's it, nothing else. No ear tests, no sight reading, no general knowledge, um, no oral. You don't have to have any pre theory prerequisites. The diploma level attracts two points. The other levels don't attract any points at the moment. They're working on that this year. COVID got in the way, they were doing it last year, but COVID got in the way. Uh, they're working on that now to um, have an alternative to be able to get the points included for that. And it'll, it will include a written component if you so choose that. So that's in the pipeline. But it's four pieces and this is how it works. It's, it's got so much flexibility. And this year, a lot of my students did the performance exam because you know, with COVID and they're at school and when, when the kids especially hit the higher grades, you know, all the things they've got to do at school. And if you, you know, you're nearly losing them out the back door because they've just got so much on their plate. This is an awesome alternative. So what you've got to do now, I'll, it says A, B, C and D. But don't think of that like a classical A, B, C and D. They're just labelling it. They could have said apples, bananas, you know, carrots and whatever, right? So the first one, A, you must choose it from the A list in the classical stream syllabus. You don't have a choice with that one. You have to choose it from there and that's all. With the B and the C, the second and third piece, you can either do two from the modern or two from the classical choosing different streams. You wouldn't, you know, take them both from, you know, as the, both blues or something. Um, or you can have one from the classical and one from the modern. How good is that, right? And then finally, your fourth piece can be from anywhere. It can be from out of the classical, out of the modern, out somewhere else, something that, you know, they've learnt. Oh, oh, I've got one girl who's come along for quite a few years. She's actually chosen her piece for the last three years. And she, the first, one of the years she came along and she'd bought the hanging tree. I don't know, does anybody know the hanging tree? Oh, it's a very eerie sort of, it used to send goosebumps up the back of my neck, right? And, um, and the words were not very nice, right? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is gonna do my head in. But in the end, I said to her, she learned it. And I said, she had plenty of time and I said, how about we choose another one? You've got plenty of time. Let's choose another one. So I steered it. She got another one. It was so much nicer, nicer lyrics, nicer everything else. And we steered it and that's the one she did for the exam. But you see, they can bring anything from anywhere as long as it's that standard. So that's how flexible it can be. And that doesn't mean to say you don't get them to do scales. Of course you do. It's not that you don't teach them, but my students, if they're doing this exam, they have to play all the keys in the piece. So if it's in C major, they've got to do all the C major scales and the arpeggios for me and the chords that go with it and you know all those. Uh, if it modulates, guess what? They've got to do that key as well, right? And that, so they're practicing scales, just not for exam presentation, that's all. And of course you've got to know the general knowledge because if you don't know the general knowledge of the piece, how can you play it properly? So we go through the general knowledge. Um, and what else don't they do? Oh, theory. They don't have to have theory as a prerequisite, but I ask them to because they want, if they want to put it on their senior certificate, it's, you know, grade four and five are accepted onto the QCE. So I like them to keep up to date with that. And so they still do their theory, but they don't have to have it as a prerequisite for the diplomas, uh, the performance exam and the diploma level of that, that actually goes through to diploma, you can little set of letters after your name, um, attracts two points. 
think that covers that. Yes. So I'm going to talk to you all about the jazz syllabus. Uh, before I do, what I was hoping Cynthia would do, we touched a bit on it in the digital piano, so I'll just do the memory game and Cynthia can jump in if I've forgotten mm -hmm. any. In the modern, we have so many different categories. We start off with blues, popular, and boogie. It then expands to ragtime at grade two. Then we have jazz and popular standards, Latin. I'm struggling, have I missed anybody? Um, no, that's six. Six. Mm. My memory hasn't <laughs> failed me. In your packs you have sampler and it's the jazz sampler and it looks like this. Before I, I start to play these, did everyone put their phone onto silent? Cynthia, is your phone on silent? Mm. Mm. Good girl. Mine's on silent too. Because we're recording this so people can see it, we've had requests from Western Australia to do workshops. Well, it's a bit far for us to go. So that's the reason we're recording this, so that we can send a link to people if they request to see what we've done. Now, the jazz syllabus so far has three levels. We will be getting level four and five, and you'll see some samples in your book. Cynthia, are you in front of the camera? Cynthia is my demonstrator model. I need my phone for the backing tracks. So we have levels one, two and three at the moment. They're for piano. I'm sorry, Lou, we haven't got a guitar yet, but it's coming. We have um, piano, we have sax, alto sax, we have tenor sax, clarinet, trumpet, and did I miss anybody? No, that's no. It. So we have five different instruments for these books. Uh, because predominantly we have pianists here today, we're going to be delving into the piano syllabus. The pieces are the same regardless of what instrument you play. You can't necessarily jam with them all together though because they're written in key appropriate for that instrument. So for instance, if I'm playing in C, the trumpet's going to want to play in B flat. That said, on the internet you can get backing tracks for these and there's practice tracks and performance tracks. The practice tracks are so much fun because instead of doing one solo, it goes round and round in circles and does four solos. It lets you do four different improvisations if you feel like it. But it's great if you're doing group teaching because you can say, Johnny, I want you to take solo one, Mary solo two, Timothy solo three, and Frederica solo four. Okay, are we ready? Go! And everyone can play the main part of the piece together, then the children can solo individually. Alternatively, because as we'll see when we go through this, the solos are built up off the same notes, they can't sound cacophonous. If they play them all together, that would work too. So if you have a group of clarinets or a group of flutes, did I mention flute? I don't think I did. We have flute for this oh, as well. Okay. I mm -hmm. think we have flute for this as well. If you have a, a group instrumental lesson, that will work too. So can we go to the sampler please? And I would like to open up to page six and we're going to look at the Canadian Calypso. Now Calypsos are built mostly or largely on arpeggios. So when we do the improv, that's going to feature some arpeggios. When we play these pieces, the first thing you have to do is you play the head and it says head you can't miss it and you play the head exactly as written no embellishment then if you look at page seven we have the solo section and to the classical musician this can be terrifying oh my goodness you mean I've got to make up the music you are joking me so I would like to do today a demonstration of soloing 101 for the classically terrified teacher. <laughs> so the first thing I would do looking at this after I caught my breath and had a piece of chocolate would be play the left hand. <laughs> didn't kill me because it was written out. I can cope with that. So now I'm going to choose one note. You can see the little fly dot notes and in bar 17 the fly dot notes, the soloing notes are G, F, A, C. I should also mention that somewhere 
there is a note about the solos. Yes, on page five, it gives you some handy hints on how to attack these solos. <coughs> so I'm going to choose one note from each group. I'm going to choose the A. Now, notice they haven't written it out for the other three bars, but you do the same pattern. So for the G minor seven, your fly dot notes would be G, A, B flat, D, and similarly for your C7. So I'm going to play just one note per bar. I'm brave, I can do that, that won't scare me. So I'm going to choose A, B flat, C, A. I survived, I'm so brave. Now I'm going to try doing two notes and can go a third. And I'll just change it. Oh, anyone who doesn't know me, I got bored very easily. So every time I do it, it tends to change. So this time I've decided to go up to C, E, C, and then I'll go F, A. I feel like an A. So let's see how that goes. That sounded pretty cool, didn't it? I'm soloing, who knew? Okay, then I could try doing the four notes. Let's try that. I survived that too. Now, just playing crotchets probably wouldn't get you heaps of marks in the exam. You'd pass the section, but we want something a bit more interesting. That's where we look back at the head. And if you look at the head, see how in bar one, we've got a quaver rest there? So I'm going to start my rhythm using a quaver rest and I'm going to be very easy for demonstration purposes and just play my four notes going up. Now I've still got more beats in the bar to go so I'm going to do an accented passing note. While that's not part of the soloing it's allowed because if you look at bar one there's an accented passing note B flat. So I'm going to incorporate that into my soloing. And then I just wanted to do that. It just sounded in my ear right. And that works well for my second bar. You don't have to fill every beat. My first two bars go two, three, four. I don't put anything on the other three beats. You don't have to overfill it. And then because I went up, I'm thinking, hmm, nice symmetry. I think I'll start on that E and come down. And I'll do a third going down. Because notice there are a lot of thirds in the head. Look at bar 2, 4, 6, 10, 12, 14. Lots of intervals of a third. And notice they're not filling it all up. They're leaving a crotch rest in a minimum. And so if you analyse what I did in the third bar of my solo, chord note, accent and passing note, chord note, chord note, accent and passing note, chord note, and two chord notes. Now, for bar 21, wh why reinvent the wheel? I'm just going to do it an octave higher. But instead of going there, to make it sound more final, I'm just going to the F. So, we've played the head, we've improvised our solo, and when I do them at home, it comes out differently every time, but I've actually notated some things so that I can actually describe what I'm doing, because at home, I tend to do it intuitively after having several pieces of chocolate, because it's scary when you're classically trained. And the first time I did this, it was very interesting. I did it, and I was happy with what I did, and I recorded it. And then I went to bed and I got up the next day and did it again and compared what I'd done with the recording. Can you guess? It was totally different. It wasn't even vaguely the same. And I should tell you when Cynthia came to stay when I was first preparing these last year, it was very new out last year. She came and I had on the piano where I'd been practicing and I was just putting dinner on the table. And I said, come on, we've got to have dinner now. Oh, I'll just, I'll just play this one. Oh, but it works well if I do this. Oh, 
But what about if I just, I'm going, your dinner's getting cold. Will you, it was like having a child. Will you leave the piano and come and eat your dinner? Because they're so much fun to play. Mm. They're addictive, mm. aren't they? Yeah. So when you go back and do the head, the, this is the third thing for the exam, you must embellish the head. I was examining a little boy in Sydney who you could have put on any stage in the world and he would have brought the house down. I was blown away by this child. He would have been 12, 13, 14, somewhere around there. So professional, so mature, brilliant improvisation. He didn't embellish the head in any of his pieces. It broke my heart and I had to take marks from this child because he hadn't fulfilled the requirements. So do make sure you embellish the head. I should point out at this stage that this is not in the syllabus and I'm very much hoping we've got a whole list of notes for the office of suggestions that we've found from these workshops. Just like there's a couple of pages in the syllabus about the performance exams, we would like to see in the main syllabi a couple of pages about the jazz exams. But when you buy this book, it tells you every single thing you need to know about how to play this, trying not to flick pages too loudly for the mic, but everything you need to know, this is your general information, and then everything you need to know about the pieces in here. So the whole syllabus is actually part of the jazz book when you purchase it. So. When I looked at this, I went, OK, it's only level two. We're not going to make it too scary. There are all these thirds. How about we just reverse them? And again, I got too bored doing that. So I put in passing notes. So everywhere on the head, if the third goes down, I've gone up and there's always a passing note. Plus, there are some parts, like in bar eight, which lend themselves to go hands together. And similarly, in the second last bar of the page, bar 15, instead of I like going. Better play the tonic or someone might get upset. OK, let's have a look. Oh, and in the coda, if you wish to embellish, you can, but it's not mandatory. Oh, and let's get the backing track. So you just look up. A N Z C A Jazz Syllabus Backing Tracks. And hey presto, they come up. And I'm going to level two. <laughs> Uh, when we were doing this, and it was really challenging when I was zooming this into the meetings up north, it suddenly occurred to me as I'd, I've, I was halfway through playing that we found when I put it flat, it didn't make so much sound. When I put it actually up on the piano, the wood helped resonate the recording. So yeah, I'll just leave it sit there now. Okay, can we turn over to page eight, The Ambling Man? Now, the head we've discussed so let's look at the solo and oh horrors it's got to repeat we've got to do two solos because we've now gone up to level three these gradings by the way are not commensurate with the regular grades so level two is level one is about 
grade two standard. So where this, there are five grades, forget the early ones, five grades, one to eight, there are going to be five levels of this. So they go across the grades. So level three would be about grade four and a half standard, maybe grade five. So let's cut straight to the solo. So again, I would be brave and I would play the left hand. And then I'd probably play one note. doing very well at the one note and I would build it up gradually the same way one note maybe two notes maybe all of the notes so for the solo let's go something easy let's do the notes of that little riff up and let's do the notes of the little riff going down now notice again in the head we have rests at the beginning so I've done a crotch rest on either side of my bar in the first one one, two, a three, a, uh, and I don't want to do the same thing because it's boring if I do the same thing coming down. So I won't do a rest at the beginning of the bar, but I'll put a rest at the end of the bar. In the next two bars, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go up, I'm going to come back. Now I'm going to do it one more time. Now when I was learning counterpoint, my teacher told me, you can do something three times in a row. If you do it more than three times in a row, that's really bad. So I've done my riff up and back three times. I can't do it a fourth time. Now this cool bass, isn't that neat, that chromatic bit? I just heard in my head to go with that. So I'm breaking it up. Again, I'm going to put a rest because that's what the head does. Isn't that pretty? I just heard that and went, that's what I want to do. Then I'm doing my riff down, just like I did in bar two. Now I've got the repeat. As you do a repeat, it's good to build some texture. So now we're going to put some triplets in. I'm going to use the first three notes and I'm going to do them down twice. And then I'm going to do the last two notes going up because I've been down, now I want to go up. And then I'll do the same in this bar, but I went down. We don't want to be boring. This time we'll go up, we'll start on the A. So we've just done the same thing, but we've reversed it. Then in the fourth bar, I thought, hmm, needs a bit more stillness. So if you look in the head in bars five and six, see that syncopated rhythm in bars five and six? I'm using that and putting a chord in. And that to me sounded good. And I went, hmm, I like these chords. I've had a lot of movement. Let's have a bit more stillness. So in the B flat minor seven bar, I've taken the bottom half of the chord. Well, can't have half, really, I can. But I'm taking the bottom three and the top three in that same syncopated rhythm. So I've got some more texture going and then I liked that bit so much I'm doing it again but in a lower octave where it's more mellow. And before my tag went down, so now my tag's going to go up. And hey presto, I've got a solo. And you just play around with it till you find something that speaks to you and you go, I like that sound and you can see I've done some annotating probably more than I would if I wasn't explaining it to you but I haven't written out the thing I've just done some notes and as I said the first time I was playing with it I played with it the first day came back it was totally different the second day and I realized if I actually want to explain the thought process I'd better write something down or you'll get a totally different variant again. Now, in the head, those crotchets are a gift. Instead of, let's put some doubles in and echo it on the left. So I did that for the first half. Now, in bar eight, to me, it was very unnatural to play minims. That just hurt. So I put the syncopation in that I wanted there. And that makes my soul happier.
Now in bar 9, rather than be boring and keeping on with the same thing, let's flip it and do the reverse. <laughs> That's nice to do, gives it a bit of symmetry. The next two bars are pretty busy anyway, so I didn't change those, but go down to the last bar, you'll see there's an A flat six chord. Anybody hear a sixth? Anyone see a sixth? Me neither. So let's put one in. Oh, isn't that nice? Now it's probably in the backing track, but I want it too. Why can't I have it in the piano as well? So let's have a listen to the Ambling Man. I'm just going to change screens, level three, and we want a swing piece. Here we go, top of the swing once. final chord there. Okay, can we turn over to something in level five? Now, we don't have a backing track for this, sadly, because, oh, that can turn itself off, because as levels four and five haven't come out in book form, we haven't got the backing tracks out yet, but they will be coming in due course. But this was such a pretty one, I wanted to share this one with you. So, we've talked about the head, let's go straight into the solo. I've used some syncopated rhythms because sambas have a lot of syncopation in them. So my rhythm I've used is <laughs> that just spoke to me. It's similar in part to line three of the head and I'm using just the notes of the little fly dots. Sorry, wrong key. And then I'm doing them down but with the repeated note because otherwise it's too boring is my repeated note. Then I did the same thing, so making a sequence for the next one. So we've had too much quaver movement now, any more would be too much, so I've put in some groups of three. So what I did there, I took the bottom three notes of bar 21 and did them twice. And then I added the last two notes. And because I've had movement, now I want stillness. You want to try and balance it. So I a chord which is E, G, A, C, which is E, is in my group. All of those notes are in my fly dot notes in 21, in my solo suggestion notes. Then, and I've used the rhythm that is in bar five and seven of the head. Because you want to try and marry it across if you can. Then in the B-flat 13, I've done the same thing, bottom three notes, then top two notes, and I've done the whole chord, except I've left out the E. Then I'm doing it again in bar 25, but if I did it the same, it'd be boring. So I thought a little diminuendo, like it's petering out. And then I've taken notes of the chords and come down in thirds because I went up, I want to come down. And 
to me that just sounded like gentle falling rain. I liked that. Now, because this one went up, this next one in bar 27, I made go down. And again, a diminuendo petering out, but I liked this, I wanted it again. Plus, you don't want to change everything constantly. You've got to have some symmetry to keep it adhesive and together. Then in bar 29, I've taken the left hand up an octave and I've just repeated what I did in bar 21. Which has put me in a lovely high position to use my soloing notes to just do a rundown. And back to that chord that I first used in 22. So this, oh, and the head. So this head is pretty busy and you don't have to do a lot, but you've got to do something. So in those intervals of fifth, which occur in bar three and bar seven, instead of I've gone and then I've gone just to fill it out a bit. And in the bar 14, instead of I thought a little auxiliary note would sound pretty there. And then in the next bar, instead of, let's add a chord. Then coming back into the, into the coda. Oh, and at the last chord of the coda, to me, this was a little stark, even though it's pretty. I think it's nicer if you roll the chord. Just a bit softer. Okay, so this is the Southern Samba. Sadly, no backing track with this one. So gorgeous. Now I'm sure you all notice the changes because again I get bored very easily and I tend to change it every time I did it. Uh, in bar four that time instead of just doing I actually added an extra note of the chord I filled it out to put an F in it and I had three chords and I think I did that somewhere else but I can't remember where else I did it. I also changed bars 13 and 14 in the left hand just slightly just to mix it up a bit to make it more interesting. Any questions on the jazz syllabus? Yes, Mary Jane. Um, so, is this something that they just get presented with and or is it some, a piece Oh, you prepare it. You yes, prepare yes. It. So you buy the jazz book yes. just like you would buy your piano exam book, and it is your exam book, yes. and they prepare this. Yes. And yes. what I would very much encourage is see if every week for two months they can come back with a different improv. They will find which improv they like the best because I experimented with it many times but found what spoke to me the most and that's what I have presented today. So they would play with it around for a couple of months and obviously at, you know, for a child it would take them longer yes. but for at least two months, at least eight lessons, maybe a term, say every week you come in I want to see something different with the soloing and then after that term say okay out of all the soloing you did which bits did you like the best and we'll keep those and present them in the exam. So no it's definitely a prepared piece. 
Okay, how are we going? I think we've got time to talk about classical before we go to morning tea. And we've got yummy morning tea. We've even got cream to go with the scones. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> had to go to a special shop to get that. So the classical syllabus, there's not a lot to say except that a lot, um, sometimes I hear teachers put it down, let's say it that way. And I've got a colleague who teaches at a school and uh, the person in charge there says, oh, Anska, that's the easy syllabus. And that really makes my blood boil because it's not the easy syllabus. If you look, Mary Jane shaking her head going, no, it's not. Because uh, yeah, Mary Jane is a, a teacher and a close friend. And I know that she is very across the syllabus too. So what I've done in some of the workshops is I've been very pedantic and gone through every list and said some things. But I think people might have dozed off. They're too polite to say so, but they might have. So I'd like to point out that we've got all the standard exercises. We've got the Cherney, we've got your Heller, Hiller, Bertini. They're right across the board. I'd like to name a couple of pieces at each grade level and tell you a bit of a story. At grade two level, hands up if you have not taught Bergmuller's Innocence, apart from you, Lou. <laughs> yeah, everyone plays that. I did that for my grade two. Uh, I think that Lukey did his for his grade two. So everyone loves that. That's on, I'm going to compare it with AMEB because it's a lot of the AMEB people say, oh, Anska's down there. So just showing some comparisons. Bergmuller, Innocence is on for grade two on so many syllabi. Hands up, apart from Lou, and maybe Sarah, if, if you haven't taught the Ballard by Bergmuller for grade three. Yeah, it's, oh, you haven't. Give that lady a lollipop. <laughs> so it's very popular. And uh, Cynthia and I have a different approach to this. She gets, or say she's got six students doing grade six. They all come in. She plays all the repertoire and they put their hand up. Whoever puts their hand up first gets that piece. Her daughter Elizabeth, in her now 30s, still hasn't forgiven her mother for not letting her have the piece she wanted in grade six because somebody else got their hand up first. Whereas with my students, I will play a variety of pieces and say, which one of these do you like? So I will often get children doing the same piece and the examiner will have to hear the same. But it's very unlikely they're going to choose their whole program the same. But that Bergmuller Innocence and the Bergmuller Ballade are both very popular choices. At grade four level, we have Grieg's lyric piece, um, The Watchman's Song. And that's on for our grade four, as it is for many boards. One of my favorite students all of all time, her name was Hazel. She stopped playing at 90 because she kept falling asleep at the piano. She's now 92 and she's just moved into care and I'll be popping over to visit her again next week. But she did the Jackie Bear Giddy Girl for her grade five and we've got it on for our grade five. At grade six, everyone wants to play the Chopin waltz in A flat. Ya da, ya da 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 That one, everyone wants to do that. We've got that one for grade six. For grade seven, we have the Beethoven Sonata Pathetique, second movement, the one made famous by Carl House and his radio programs. Yep, that's on for our grade seven too. My favorite is the grade eight. Uh, before I come back to my favorite, we've got <coughs> Haydn Sonata in E minor, which is such a popular choice across all the boards. Yes, it's on for our grade eight. But one great thing about Ansgar, which I'll talk about more after the break, is Sometimes, in a rare case, you will find a student that doesn't speak, their soul doesn't match anything on a particular list. I've occasionally found this in grades seven and eight in the list C. That Beethoven, for instance, that I think is so beautiful. My student was a fast and furious girl and she said, but I want to play the third moment. And so I wrote to Ansgar and sent an email off, said, can my student X please play the third movement instead of the second movement? They went, tick, sure. So we're not silly as teachers. We're not going to try and put in something that is unreasonable. If there is something you really want a student to play, Ansgar is very open to that. Unlike other boards who say, just put up with it. We're not budging. And I love Ansgar because they listen. And my funny story for grade eight is, there are lots of preludes and fugues, and I'm very big on preludes and fugues for classical, 
but so many of my students love the Italian concerto first movement. And so, yes, I'm seeing nods. So I've had students come in and say, please, can I play the Italian concerto? I'm going, well, it's not on the syllabus. So I sent that through to the office so many times. You will notice on page 94 of the syllabus <laughs> in grade eight, list A, J.S. Bach, yes, the Italian concerto is now listed. I think they got sick of me asking for it. And they obviously went, okay, lots of people want to play this. So they really listen. So my Italian concerto got on the syllabus. And I think that's me done for classical, except to say that if you do a classical exam, you can do a modern piece for your list D. Mm. And many of my students will do a modern piece for their list D. They'll do their three classicals and a modern for list D. My sister is my twin soul. She teaches mainly modern, but her children do list A, B and C as modern and then they do a classical piece for list D. Yeah. And when I was teaching in one school in particular, all my students did modern because that school only did modern. And in my private studio as well, I've had modern students who always do a classical. If they're doing a modern, they always do a classical for list D. So it is very flexible. And at that mm. point, I think mm. we invite the lovely people to morning tea. I just wanted to, um, just it's something I thought about that I forgot to mention in the modern. If you look through the modern, from grade four up, the improvisation is mandatory. You've got to do at least one. From grade three. From grade three. But before that, if you want them to do backing tracks with them, um, you, you've got music like um, there's uh, Mark Gibson's works, there's Christopher Norton's works. They all have backing tracks with them and you're allowed to use those in the modern as well, up to two pieces. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, it's very flexible and where you can actually, you know, get the fullness of it is that if you're doing that performance exam or like Kerry doing the classical exam and you come to choose a modern for your free piece, you can go to town, you can embellish, you can use a backing track. That's right. It's like open slather. It's just such a lovely um, gift to have so much freedom. That's right. Yeah. And right from my little ease, even before they start playing, there's a piece in one of the books that I teach from that really lends itself to a glissando and a tremolo at the end. So that's their first touch. And they go, really, you're going to let me do that? And I go, yes. And when my students do their modern for their list D, even though it's a classical, ex classical exam, we embellish those pieces. Mm. Similarly, if you're doing a modern piece, there's we have Martha Mir and Dennis Alexander and Sonny Chua are three of our big composers that we have. And I also want to say in the modern, we have a lot of Australian composers, especially in the early grades, it's all Australian composers, mm. which is great if your children are going to a Stedford because there's always an Australian composer section and they've already got their Australian piece. But if you're taking a classical piece over to your modern, there's one piece, Almost a Waltz by Del Dennis Alexander, which while it's on for the classical syllabus, to me, it sounds much more like a jazz waltz. So when I take that across to the modern, I let the students improvise that. And I've got one student sitting her grade four this year, and she's improvised it out of its mind. It sounds amazing, this is mm, Leah. Mm. And she's just doing such a beautiful job. So even though it's a classical piece we've moved across, it's in the modern exam, so she's improvising that one. Mm. Okay, are there any questions before we break for morning tea? No? They all need a cup of coffee or tea, I think. Very good. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a lovely morning tea. We got that from Miette's, if you're thinking, man, that was yummy. Okay, so that's where we got it from. They have lovely food, don't they? Um, all right, I want to talk to you about the theory side of things very quickly, because our theory for Ansgar is just a little bit different. And it'll be in the front of your book. Um, on the singing syllabus, it's on page eight. So in the keyboard syllabus, it should be on the same sort of page. <coughs> okay. Ansgar have two theory sessions a year. One in May, one in October. They used to always be in October, then they shifted to September because of the NAP plan, and then they went back to October, um, back into October. So 
It's one in May, one in October. At the beginning of the session, remember I told you about the handbook, which they're working through now. And as a matter of fact, um, while Kerry was speaking, I got a text from the Home Office saying, can I please quickly critique it because they want to get it out by tomorrow. So I've got to do that as soon as I'm finished the meeting this afternoon. I've got to critique it with all the reps and so forth because I'm Queensland rep. I've got to make sure all the details are right. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, the handbook will be out. It'll be on the website, but you know you can get a hard copy. That's no problem. Um, if you put students in for exams, they'll just automatically send you one. All right, now, ANSCAR theory starts at preliminary. Most boards start at grade one. We start at preliminary and it's the easiest little exam. If you have a look at it, when you come up there's papers there to look through and there's the book to look through. We have a book that goes with this, this one here. And there, it's a fun little book to do and they have a really, really good knowledge of music. By the time they're finished, they have a good knowledge of it. So this is easy to do up to, from prelim, Grade one and two, they should be able to get 100%. I'm, I'm a bit tough on my students and so is Kerry. We both agree that they should get 100% and that's my, that's my bar. And I absolutely train my kids that if they get 100%, there's gonna be woohoo because I have a little incentive scheme going in my studio. We, um, some kids do this book some kids I start straight on to these papers. It depends on where they are in their music journey. And once they've done about three of these papers, um, I don't mark, I just, you know, it's input from me. Once they've completed about three of the papers, by about paper four, poss possibly four, but absolutely five, they have to, I start marking and I say to them, I'm out to get you, I am. If you've got the, th the time signature, you know how they've got to write it in the top two spaces and the next two spaces? If your little stick of the four is pointing out below the line, nee, off comes quarter of a mark. Kerry says half a mark for her, right? Mm. So I'm really particular about it. You know, it's so tricky to get those accidentals on the lines and spaces, isn't it? And lining up with the note that you want it to be married to. It's really tricky. And sometimes kids, you know, we teach it, but they go home and do it and, you know, they've got the, the C space and then, but you know, the little flats on the line above it, bang, off comes a mark. If they get, um, and I say to them for the first, you know, for the first, however many papers they like, they can look up all the information. I don't mind because, you know, they have to do 16 papers minimum for me for leading up to an exam and um, you get four in the back of the prelim book you can buy these separately from ANSCA and um, anyway they've got to do 16 papers and uh, if they get a hundred percent on the paper I put a sticker on the front of the paper and the person the student that's got the most hundred percent papers going into the exam gets a ten dollar note off me now and only one person will get that. If they're tied, I would do it, but I've never had a tied one, right? It's always been one person. Now, a little boy last year uh, got seven 100% papers out of 16. And he had an adult close on his heels. She just didn't get enough time to get all the papers in. That's all other. She would have beaten him. But he got, he got a $10 note off me. Now, the other little incentive is when they do go into the exam room and they do do their paper, because it's marked independently. I don't mark it. It goes to Melbourne to be marked. Um, if you get 100%, you get a $10 note off me. Now the little like, oh, that goes with that is one year I had 23 students sitting. And I thought, far out, if they all get, you know, 100%, I'm in trouble here. Um, but like I say to them, it's easy to get 100%. It is easy, 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 but it's not because if you're careless or you don't know your work, when they start to write in, in the early early kind of papers, I say, if you, can, if you can't find some, if you don't know it's something or you're not sure, and you write it in in pencil, because theory, pa theory papers are done in 2B pencil, um, I said, look it up, but you just got to write it in in pen. And you won't get in trouble if you're in pen, off me, right? But if I ask you, 
If you, can, if you come with a paper and it's all pencil and I ask you something off the paper and you don't know it because you didn't do the right thing, you have to write it out 20 times. And so I'm a bit tough when it comes to theory because I feel that if you know your theory, it's going to help with your reading, it's going to help with lots of understanding of your music. And the other thing is we get asked quite often whether ANSCA is going to do an online, you know, digital exam. And the answer is an emphatic no. No, they won't. And for two reasons. One is they want students to be able to write music. You can go through your whole music life doing your theory online and you'll never be able to write a crotchet or a, an accidental on a line or whatever. So no, no. They want students to do the writing of it. The second thing is we get it done under supervision. Like for example, if you're one person in some remote town, yes, the paper will be sent, but you've got to have a, 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 an approved supervisor to sit you, to look over you while you're doing it so that you're not cheating from a book. Um, if you're in a centre like Brisbane or like we have up at the Wood Sundays, like it's not that big, but I go to one of, one of the schools there, private school, and they let me have their library. And they set up the library so it's all individual desks like this. And I have students that sit in there and they're from all over, like some of them go to state school, some are, are from that school. And so they're quite happy for the students to come and sit there. So uh, in Mackay, in May, they don't have many sitting. There might be a handful sitting and they sit at the um, rep's home that's set up as a studio and she's got them individually, you know, placed. Um, if it's her students that are sitting, she gets another approved supervisor in. So, and then in the October when there's quite a few, she usually rents out a room at the TAFE or one of the halls or somewhere like that. So it's under supervision. And so there's no chance that you can cheat your way through because you can't do an open book exam or anything like that. So they're the, they're the two reasons, and um, which you know I agree with. I think kids should be able to write music. Now, the other thing that I like about this, it goes through um, right up to your letters. Now, what did I do with that? Did I put it over there? Oh, yes. You know how I talked earlier about you have a mainstream classical and a mainstream modern. When you get to grade four, <coughs> you do the general theory, you know, your timing and scales and all that sort of stuff. Come on over. Intervals, transposition, all that normal stuff. Come on over. You've got <coughs> Um, cadences, you've got four part that comes in, uh, sorry, harmony that comes in at this stage. Now in grade four, that harmony is a figured bass, given figured bass. And then you've got to harmonise that. It comes over here, that's how all students have to do that, whether they're doing, you know, classical stream, modern stream, any other instrument, they still have to do this. Come across to here, you've got melody writing, but this is where it starts to split. If you're doing classic stream, you've got two part writing there. If you're doing modern stream, you know how Kerry was doing the improv on that jazz syllabus today? Or I filled and embellished in on the single line of the, you know, the, um, the one that we use instead of the sight reading? Well, this is it in written form. They give you a very, very simple line and you're asked to fill and put in unessential notes. And they give you an opening to give you an idea of what they'd like, and away you go. And they've got chord structure above. So it's just like you're playing it on the piano. You just have to write it down, that's all, for modern. And then come on over. We have a little bit more that's um, common ground between the classical and the modern. But then the general knowledge, it splits again. And so you are in the classic stream and you're being asked for the very first question, give the approximate time frame of the Baroque period. But if you're a modern student and you're doing modern exams, you do the modern theory and it says name the ragtime style of rag name the ragtime style of ragtime that emerged in New York in the early 1900s. 
Do you see? So it's, it's relevant to what you're actually studying at the piano, which is awesome. And then it goes on to grade five and six and above to do the same thing. From there, it's a split stream. Depends whether you're doing modern or classical. Isn't that awesome? I really like that. Um, I have to say, my 100%, any, um, I haven't done it for grade three, I really should because it has a little bit of component in grade three where you have to do a little melody and you know, you can't guarantee 100% on that can you, sort of that's a creative area. So I might have to be kind to the grade threes and pull them down to 95. If you get 95 and above for it was grade four, um, you get a $10 note off me or a sticker on your paper because of creativity, so you can't sort of guarantee that can you. So that's that. But if you get the book that goes with it, there's a fabulous book out called um, From Blues to Pop and Bop and Beyond. It's an amazing book, absolutely amazing book. And they take their questions from here for the modern stream. It's got um, every genre that you have, every stream that you have in the modern syllabus. It's got blues, boogie woogie, ragtime, Latin American jazz and pop and rock. So, you know, you can go through, get all your questions or answers out of there. And the other thing, say, uh, this is called From Blues to Bop and Beyond. Now, in your packet that you're given this morning, there is um, a blue form, a blue order form in there. You can order um, from ANSCAR and because you're at the workshop there's two things happening today you can either order from the workshop um, and they'll send it to you free postage with 20% off but if you actually buy anything from the table after it's finished we're going to sell off the books that we have today and then I don't have to actually pack them back and take them in my luggage it cost me $45 to bring up down down yeah down <laughs> and um, yeah um, and I won't have to send them back to NSCAR so they're going to give you 25% off today if you actually buy off the table mm hmm okay so <clears throat> and then you've got the theory books and see classical stream general knowledge and there's modern stream general knowledge in there as well so if you've got this book and you've got this book for modern, the questions are going to come from there. There's no surprises, they're in there. If they've studied them like a textbook, they're home and hosed. And if you go back and you get past papers, now I would suggest if you are applying to ANSCAR to get some past papers, and they're, again, they're on the blue water form, about $2.20 or something like that they are, um, just request from 2015 onwards because they are the most current ones because they had a slight change. They upgraded the theory syllabus and from 2015 that was, um, they're, they're the most current ones. If you go before that, I've got them right through from 2000. If you go before that, um, the, some of the questions, like for example in prelim, they never used to ask about the tie. It was a grade one question. But now with from 2015 on, the tie is part of the preliminary question. Okay. Um, I think that's it for theory. Okay, very good. This is where I do my passionate bits. So I get very excited when I talk about this. I would like to tell you why ANSCA is the best. And I'm going to put this here so I can reference because I always forget something and because we're recording it I don't want to forget anything today. I was first introduced to ANSCA more than 30 years ago and I started teaching at a new school and say this is the doorway to the staff room, I had one foot in the door. I didn't even get the second foot in and it was morning tea and a bunch of the teachers looked up and said, oh, you must be the new teacher. Just so you know, we only do ANSCA here. I hadn't even got in the staff room. And so I said, okay, what's ANSCA? And they told me, and this school only did modern. So all of my students there did ANSCA. And I thought, wow, this is a really great system. I have found over the years, my favorite three things are the transparency of the system, the friendliness of the examiners, and the fact that you get the marks out of 100, you can see exactly where you are going. There is a fourth one. 
which is more for metropolitan, which we are, you can have the exams in your own studio. I'd like to speak first to the transparency. We have marks out of 100. You can see very clearly where you have lost marks. We can tell the children, practice your scales to we're blue in the face. And if they don't do it, if they say get 10 out of 20, which would be a very low mark for scales, they'll go, oh, my teacher was right. Who knew? You can see exactly where it is. How many times have you with other exam boards had a glowing report and they get a C? Or a report that says not one nice thing about the child and they get an A? And I'm going, what? I had a little girl probably about 25 years ago and she did an exam with another board. She did preliminary. She was nine years old. She memorised her entire program and she got a B. Now, she was an A student in my opinion, but we can have a bad day in the exam room and I understand that. My beef was that there was not one encouraging word on this report. The examiner tore the trial to shreds. It can't have been so bad because she got a B, but there was not one encouraging word and she had not one word to say, well done, memorising your program. This little girl quit and that broke my heart that somebody did that to this child and it broke her so badly there was no coming back. That will never happen in an ANSCO exam. There is always something kind that you can say. And we are all trained to say something positive first and then if something needs to be improved, well, then we will say this is where you could improve. Say something is worth 14 marks. If you get 12 out of 14 for that piece, you will see very clearly in the comments where you lost those two marks. You won't get a glowing report and lose marks. You won't get a disastrous report and get full marks. It is very accountable. And I have had the office ring me when they have a, had a question on a report. They keep a close eye on quality control. For instance, we've recently gone over to the digital reports, which was terrifying at first. And normally I would say, you know, with the general knowledge, well, you got this bit wrong, but you got that wrong. Um, and you got this right, but that wasn't quite spot on. So my only way of showing that with the digital one was I'd put two ticks and a cross. I got a phone call the very next day saying, did you ask more than four general knowledge questions? I went, no, of course I didn't. Well, why are all these ticks and crosses? And I'm going, that's because I was trying to say it was mostly right and a little bit wrong or mostly wrong and a little bit right. And so they're watching. So no matter who comes to examine your students, it should be the same across the board. The standard is not going to be up here and down here because the office is very keen on quality control. Also, I think it's fair because I teach a couple of dyslexic students. No matter how hard they practice their sight reading, they're never going to be as good as a child that does not suffer from dyslexia. If you're with the AMEB, it's three strikes and you're out. You can be brilliant, but you can't do your sight reading, boom, you become a B student. Doesn't matter if everything was perfect apart from that. And I personally feel that's very unfair to someone who is dyslexic or may have some other disability. Even if you put it in writing, it doesn't seem to cut the mustard. Our sight reading is worth 10 marks. Say you got zero out of 10, and you're never gonna get zero out of 10. Even if you have a stab at it, and it doesn't even sound remotely like it does on the page, we're gonna give you some marks for trying. You know, give it a go, you will definitely get some marks. But say you got zero out of 10 for sight reading, you've still got 90, you do everything else well, you can still get an A with ANSCA. To me, that's fair. Also with the transparency, I was in another state, and I won't even say where it was, and I won't even say the gender of the teacher, I was in another state examining, and the teacher at the end of the day said, can I ask you a question? And I said, well, I'll answer it if I can. And she said, oh, I've said the gender of the teacher, never mind. <laughs> and she said, how did my students do with their sight reading? I said, well, strictly speaking, I can't tell you anything about the exams, but I can actually tell you that I was blown away by the high level of sight reading. And she stood up with pride and she said, 
that's good because last time you were here you gave them really low marks for sight reading and I thought wow I've got to improve my game because all of the students were poor in sight reading and I thought wow how good is that the transparency even goes across to the teachers that th this teacher can see all her students were weak in that area she must be doing something wrong and she took measures to improve that so that made me thrilled that you can see very clearly where you've lost the marks in the exam. The other thing I love is we have what we call the betterment factor up to and including grade two because we want kids to come out of the exams going wow that was so much fun when can I do the next one. We don't want them shivering in their boots going oh this is so frightening. So say something is worth 17, 16 out of 18, we'll probably give it 16 and a half or 17 in those lower grades as an encouragement factor so that the children want to come back for more. We want to create a generation of musicians who love to play their instrument and they're not frightened to do an exam. So by the time they get to grade three, they've gained that confidence that they can perform well. I've had it in the exam room where children have been so frightened and you just give them gentle encouragement. For instance, in the scales, the first thing they do, I had one child that couldn't play a scale to save a life. I could tell she knew them. She was just so frightened. But because I was encouraging and then stopped and I asked her, you know, how her day had been and does she have a cat or a dog and just, you know, took her off subject just for a couple of minutes and got her in a calmer place, this little sweetheart played them like a dream. So the examiners will always be nice to the kids. That's the other thing. We are hand picked you can't put your hand up and say I want to be an ANSCO examiner they look at the people out in the field and you get a tap on the shoulder and you get invited to be an examiner and they are looking for people who are warm and encouraging for the students who will make a positive exam experience for the child so that they can fulfill their potential I'll just check and see if I've left anything off transparency consistency fair yep encouraging friendly examiner up oh, the last and one of the most important things exams in the own studio we can have the exams in your own studio now the syllabus says if you have three hours of examining you can have the examiner come to you and whether you're in a school situation or a private studio situation that is the case that said, if you've got a little bit under, they usually let that happen. I, I once had to go to the middle of New South Wales for 30, no, an hour and five minutes of exams. I was in the car for 12 hours and did one hour of examining. That was a little extreme. But on the whole, they say three hours. And I love that because the children can be in the environment that they know, they're on the instrument that they normally play on. If it's a piano for a guitar, you take a guitar with you. But when it's a piano, every piano is different and that throws some children. So they're in the environment they know, they're on the instrument with which they're familiar. My little cat Tatiana Bunny comes to all the exams and she sits on the couch and keeps the children company just like she does in their lessons and it's that familiarity that gives them a much better chance to shine when they're in their own studio environment. So those are the reasons that I think ANSC is the best. I came over from the dark side 30 years ago. Up until about a decade ago, I would occasionally get transfer students from other boards who wanted to continue with that board. I no longer do that. I feel that my time is too valuable and I want my life to be pleasant. I'm not going to deal with other boards. If they come to me wanting to do another board, I say, I am not the teacher for you. Please go and find someone else if you're not willing to change over because this is the best system and I don't want my kids to have anything less than the best. Over to you Cynthia. Thank you. Um, just to follow on with what Kerry's saying about the certificate and the marking, remember I said earlier today what the marking kind of was. So an exam report looks like this. For the lower grades you've got the three pieces and you know the marks down the side so you'll actually be able to see what mark they got for that particular piece or scales or whatever and then there's a comment down the bottom and it's got the you know achievement levels right on the bottom of it so <coughs> for the higher grades you've got the four pieces and then for the performance level 
that's it there. So you'll only get one, a one sort of sentence comment under each piece, but if you notice the overall performance, the section at the bottom is much larger and that's where you'll get a lot of feedback in that area through there. And you've just got to make sure that if you do your performance exam, it's got to be, it is a performance exam. The, the, the sort of, um, you know, the take, give away and take, give and take on that is you don't have anything else to fall back on. So you have to do this as a performance exam. And if you want your mark to be high, then you have to pull out the goods, even though there's only four pieces. So it's certainly not <coughs> a dumbed down exam because kids do other things. They've got time to do other pieces, but they don't have to get them uh, to exam presentation. Or you might be doing a Steadfits or competitions or something like that that you want to, you know, besides uh, dovetailing and, and coming across, you might do something in the exam, uh, something in the exam that you want to take across to the Steadfit. And the other thing I'll say, well, I've got this out, <coughs> um, is your name as a teacher goes on the certificate. This, this certificate here actually belongs to a drum student whose teacher doesn't like to teach theory and they've got to have as, as a prerequisite to come through. So he came across to me to do it. Um, and if you notice, he got a first class honours. I can't quite remember what his report was, but you know, for what was it, grade two, I would have expected it to be in the 90s, up in the 90s, 95 plus and that he would have got that, I know I was quite tough. So, but I really love that you can have your name on the certificate as well, because you've done half the work, haven't you, as a teacher? You know what I mean? You know, you say to the student, well done, you know, and the parent goes, oh, isn't that wonderful? And you think, yeah, well, I've put in hours as well. Okay, so I like that touch. And I was just told uh, by another examiner that you can actually, if you've got um, credentials after your name, you can actually get them put on there, and I didn't know that, so I'll have to do that put it on. I just wanted to pop in and say yes. while you were talking about the four pieces that we had a workshop yesterday in Toowoomba and <coughs> one of the teachers who came over to the light last year and her exams were I think in November she said the thing that convinced her to come to ANSCA and change over was that we only ever have four pieces. Now when I was a little girl I did AMEB, I had a very strict teacher who wasn't a very nice person, I now know in retrospect. And when I would walk into my lesson after the exam, the first lesson back should say here are your eight pieces for the year, my four mains, my four extras, that's all we ever did. If I tried to learn something for myself when I was very tiny, she actually yelled and screamed at me and said, don't you ever dare to learn a piece without me teaching it to you. So I never sight read. As a result, my children are all brilliant sight readers because I will never let a child have that happen. And this teacher who came over said, this is what convinced me to come because as ANSCA teachers, it is expected that we are teaching more than the four pieces in the year. Other boards force you to do more, but we only do four, which then frees up time to do mm. a Steadford's competitions, other performances, Christmas carol concerts. We're not just focusing on exam pieces for the whole year, and ANSCA teachers all teach much more repertoire than the four. Mm. Thanks, Duff. In your packet as well, <coughs> Is, uh, there's a few things. This is the PRAC entry, and I just want to just quickly go through this because sometimes we have new teachers not filling it in correctly. So it's all the normal stuff up here, which is, you know, whatever, whatever you want to go on the certificate goes in here. So as I've learned, if you've got credentials after your name, put them in because they will then put them on there. Um, you can pay by internet banking or a cheque or credit card. You can choose your own centre or you can choose to go to someone else's centre. Say you've got a friend and you know they're going to be putting students in but you haven't got quite enough and you ask your friend can you go there and they say yes, <coughs> then that can happen as well. Or you can just be assigned a, a centre if you haven't got you know enough students in your centre. Now over here it wants you to list if you've got any students with disabilities um, and that need you know special consideration that goes in here if there's any days you're not available that goes in there as well so they take all that into consideration when they're scheduling your exam and then when you come over here 
Um, it's just, you just fill it out print because of course it's easier if you print, you're going to get the right um, spelling and so forth if you print. But it's this part here that sometimes gets mixed up. See where it's got classical and modern and then it's got instrument, grade and fee. The fee you'll find in the back of the handbook which is being printed, they want to get it out tomorrow so the fee will be there, it'll be on the website. Um, but you can request a hard copy. Um, you put your instrument, so say it's piano and I'm doing classical piano or if it's modern I put it down here. If you're doing the performance, it really doesn't matter where you put it, but just put it in there and say performance. Just cross that out and put performance so they know it's a performance exam. If it's a digital piano exam, the same thing. Put, cross it out and put digital piano exam so they know what you're on. Otherwise they'll enter you for the wrong one. Um, don't forget if they're grade 10 and up they will have a Louis number which is a learner's unique identification code um, from school and they'll get given that from grade 10 and sometimes you, they don't even know they've got it. You've got to say go and ask the school. Yes you definitely have one. So from grade 10 up of course they can start accumulating points for the QCE and with so if you have say uh, a ten, you know, like a, 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 he's in grade 10 at school and he's doing a grade 6 prac exam in grade 10, he can count that towards his points. Um, if he's doing grade 4 theory and he's in grade 10 at school, he can count that towards his points. So in fact, if you do grade 4 theory in grade 10 and grade 5 theory in grade 11, because that's how I do it, I start my students off with their prelim at grade 6 and then we go through like that so that by the time they get to grade 10 they're doing grade 4 theory and by the time they get 11 grade 5 theory we do it in May so that it's out of the road for their academic years unless of course they're going to do music as a career and like I've got one student who said I th he's only just studying grade 5 this year and he said to me um, oh, Mrs D I think I might do grade 6 next year but, okay so that's an extra you know point he can have um, so that's, yeah, that's with the QCE. So that's where you've got this Louis number and you've got to put that on there if they're in grade 10 and above and you want them to count it on their senior certificate, make sure you put the Louis number on there. Um, prerequisites, if you are say doing grade 6 exam and it might be a practical exam, it's in the middle of the year, you haven't done your theory yet, the grade 3 theory that goes across with that, um, they will sit their grade 6 prac they will get their report but they won't get their certificate until they've done the grade 3 theory. So I usually like to do it at the beginning of the year, the theory is out of the road, then you're concentrating on your um, practical and then you'll get the both certificates in that year, otherwise you've got to apply for it. And I think you said it costs something it, there, to release There's it. a fee attached. Yeah, a fee it's attached not big, but there yeah. is a fee. Okay, so I think that's that. And the other thing uh, I want to talk about is the subscription. You don't need to be a subscribed teacher to enter students for their exams. If you enter students for their exam, um, you can either do that by the paper method or you can do it online. Um, I know some teachers that do get their students to, you know, do it themselves. They do it themselves online. But the problem with that is um, all the, you know, receipt and everything that goes back to the student, it doesn't come to you. So I don't let mine do that online. That's just me. Um, what I, and I like a record of what I've done, what, you know, what the kids, what students I've put in for the year. So I fill this out, I fill this out, I screenshot it, and then I email it to them, and I internet bank. It's as easy as that. And then, then you've got a paper record of it as well. Um, with the subscription, um, you get electronically four strettos a year and the strettos are worth the weight in gold. There's all the information, what's happening in the ANSCAR, when the ceremony, uh, graduation ceremonies are, um, any articles that teachers have sub, you know, submitted and what's happening around the branches. Um, you know, when I say branches, towns, you know, in, in, in um, Australia, it's, it's Australia and New Zealand wide. We also are in um, Asia. Do you know the countries we're in Asia? Yes, we're in there? Malaysia, Hong Kong, Indonesia and Thailand. And Singapore looks to be coming online. Oh, Singapore yeah. is too, yes. Yeah. Mm. We may have lost Hong Kong, but Indonesia is growing and I was in Thailand the year before last. Yes. So, yes, so there you go. So if you are a subscribed teacher, you get a stretto. 
um, for a year. You get 15% off your books whenever you order. You are on the teacher recommended list. So say someone rings up ANSCAR and says, look, I'm shifting to blah, blah. Um, is there an ANSCAR teacher there? They will recommend you. You're on the list of recommended ANSCAR teachers. And there was one more thing. Oh, yes, when we have an NSCAR conference, which is usually about every two years, um, we should have had one last year. Rats. Mm -hmm. Thanks, COVID. Um, so, yeah, every t two years or so, I guess it won't be, they won't be looking at it now till about 22, of course, um, you get a discount for being a registered teacher. Okay, so. And you get 15% off all purchases. Yes, yeah, I said that. Yeah. You did. Okay, but um, anyway, so that's that. But today, like I said, if you actually buy off the table, um, you can take the books. You'll just have to fill in a blue form and put your credit card on there so that they can charge you for that. But you'll get 25% off. Okay. Um, I think that's... Music money. Okay. All right, now, I feel a bit, I feel a bit like awkward doing this but when I say awkward I have I'm a teacher that teaches with incentive I, I believe in prizes and you know ten dollar notes if you get a hundred percent that sort of thing you know what I mean and I've got a couple of schemes going in my um, studio that help children with practice because you know sometimes they need to be trained to do that and I'll give you a handout In the COVID, now normally, this is what I normally do for practice. A child gets handed one of these in week one. You see it's got four weeks, so the second time it gets handed out, it basically covers the term. And then I have a special one that goes from the end of term over the holidays into the first week of next term. If they do five practices a week, they get a dollar music money. Now this music money, Is available off the Susan Parada site. I've got it. I've got it in my phone. So if you need to, if you'd like to have a look at it, I'll, sh I'll get it up for you and you can go into her site. She's got this music money and it comes in dollars or five dollars or ten dollars or twenty dollars. My lovely husband of 46 years has, um, well, 46 this year, um, has actually printed them off and laminated them and then cut them out individually for me. Isn't he a blessing? So, you know, because a lot of that goes out for the year. So if they do five practices per week, they get a dollar music money. If they do six practices per week, they get $2 music money and a sticker on the sheet. If they get seven days practice per week, which is very difficult, and you know what? If they miss a day because they've got something on they might go to church or they might play soccer on that day and they just can't get their practice in that's okay just like divide up the minutes on the other days it's all good you can do that right or you can double up on the weekend or something and so um, if it's seven days practice per week you get three dollars music money and two stickers now if you do two lots of those in a term and you do two stickers two stickers two stickers and two stickers eight stickers per sheet gives you an extra dollar music money bonus and a bonus jar pick. Now I have uh, natural snake lollies, you know, like the binkers, you know, that, that so that kids don't, you know, they all artificial glasses, all that. And, but then I have my wicked chocolate box, you know, like all the chocolates and, you know, skittles and all that sort of stuff. Um, and on the back, you'll see my prizes. I have, it's a dollar for, for a snake lolly. So if you've done five practices for the week, you can get a snake lolly. Um, if you have got $3 to spend, you can have out of my chocolate box. Uh, $10, if you wanna save up your money, um, $10 gets your present box pick. And I normally raid places like Daisy O and you know, all those sort of things where it's gonna cost me between three and five dollars, you know, around about three dollars and you know, lots of places. And the kids love going through that box. Um, if you get $15 of music money, that's a $5 note in real money, because that speaks to lots of kids, um, or an ice cream voucher. Um, if you get $20, you can have tuck shop at school. Now I teed up with the schools in my district. 
that if a child came across with a special certificate from Mrs D that said I'm allowed tuck shop that whatever they wanted they could get and then just you know contact me and I'll pay it now I've figured out that for a full tuck shop meal that a child would eat you know drink and a whatever and a whatever um, came to about seven dollars right and the kids love that because a lot of kids can't parents can't afford tuck shop you know to give their child seven dollars worth of tuck shop you know so they really love that one and then thirty dollars is a movie pass now we don't have movie we don't have a movie theater where I am at the Whit Sundays you've got to go to Bowen which is about 45 minutes away or Mackay which is an hour and a half so to go to the movies where I am is a very special thing right you just don't go to the movies you have, it's a it's a treat and so $30 for a movie pass or $45 for a movie pass with the works which means they get a drink popcorn and you know probably an ice cream or something so you know this has worked so well for me but just last year and I had no inkling about COVID trust me just last year I decided I just wanted to just do something different I've done this for years and it works very well I, I don't know why I didn't follow my own advice you know if it's not broke don't don't try and fix it because it was amazing so anyway I decided that in the first term I would do an ice cream voucher and so I said to the kids you don't have to every time you practice you color in an ice cream every time you practice um, parent has to sign across the top of the cone to say yes how much practice they do they do the equivalent of their lesson so if they're a 30 minute lesson they're going to do 30 minute practice now beginners are exempt from that because you know what beginners are like they nearly plop off the chair so they don't have to sit there for 30 minutes not the little beginner tutor you know first year out but if you are say doing heading up to do an introductory or a um, preparatory exam yeah you've got to do 30 minutes practice if you do a 40 minute lesson it's a 40 minute practice guess what the seniors who do an hour lesson have to do an hour's practice every day now there's enough there to sort of get you nearly through the term right nearly through the term if you hand it out in week one you know by about week eight they're starting to come back in full and they got you know some have got a bit of leeway and it's a good encouragement <coughs> because if you see that they're going to run out of days you're going to say you won't be allowed to the ice cream party if you haven't got that filled in now we and we were there was a new gelato bar that started up at the Wid Sundays this was pre-covid in term one and I said we'll go to the new gelato bar well I got I normally have around about 40 students in my studio and about you know, five six nine ten depending on what it is uh, adults the rest are littlies or senior students and I had 15 back by the end of term and then COVID hit so we couldn't go everything was closed down for a term and um, and then we sort of swam out of it in term three and then term four came along and I thought oh because you know everybody's flagging you've all, all gone through it and I thought what can I do so I pulled these out and I said right the 15 kids that have already done this because they're already on the roll they're already you know up and running but anyone who'd missed out I said if you can do this I'll take you for an ice cream there's a lovely little pop-up shop at our um, just down the road from me and it does all natural ice cream it's called fruity licious and it's all done on fruit and it also offers a dairy free option so I thought yes that covers everybody and um, th they work their socks off I tell you I think I ended up having 15 26 I had 26 students plus I had promised my senior students who you know really they don't need to fill an ice cream at that point you know doing grade 8 grade 7 um, I said I would shout them one because they did so well in the exams my, I think one of my um, one of my grade eights got 96 for his performance exam he was brilliant so and the rest of them you know they're normally up in their up in the honors so or in their 90s so that's what we did we did that and the parents came along they thought it was amazing and you know to do it it was sort of in lieu of a Christmas present really they had to work for it but if you'd like one of those I'm, I can hand one of those out I can hand my sheet out that does about my uh, practicing but the other thing that I've been asked and asked about I did an interview with BlackRock at APPC about my memory award system and 
Um, I've had people, look, I've just finished talking to a teacher last week and we were on the phone for about two hours because she went to the uh, ENSCO website, saw that interview and she said, I want to know in detail what you do with that thing. And the moment I start to explain it, in Townsville, this, the supervisor there said, at the end of it, she said, oh, Cynthia, she said, is that written down anywhere? And I went, no, I'm sorry, you're the second person that's asked me, it's just up here. So I will have to write it out, I guess. But um, anyway, so if you wanted to get your pencil and paper out while I'm doing this. When I was 16, I used to do a lot of Estedfords. When I was 16, it was my last Estedford in Townsville because they, the Townsville Estedford back then, uh, I don't know whether they go on now, but at 16, you had to stop. That was your final section you could be in. And my teacher, who was a bit of a stickler like yours, insisted that I play my piece by memory. Now, I hadn't done memory work before, but because it was 16, I'm 16, it's my last one, she wants me to play it by memory, it's on the grand piano, it's like all that. And I was so nervous, I still remember the piece I played. It's called Night in May, by, um, you know, yeah, but he's nodding, you know that piece, yeah, huh? So I had it. Now, you know how you gotta put your feet on the pedal and you know, start, and my leg was shaking so badly and my hands were shaking so badly because no music in front of me. And I thought I'd press the wrong pedal. I thought I'd got the, you know, the, the damper, the soft pedal on the left. So I thought, oh, far out. And I kept going, but oh gosh, I was nervous. I was just a wreck. And I vowed and declared when I became a teacher, I started teaching at 16 under my, under my teacher's umbrella. I thought, when I get to be a teacher in my own right, my students are not going to ever be scared of memory work. I'm not going to have that happen to them. So as I've started to teach, and I can honestly say, I don't know where I got this idea from, whether I've sprung board off one of the other teachers, I have never seen this written down to do it. Um, I decided that I'd get my students to do memory work. So it starts when they're in, they're a little, you know, you know, you get little tutors and they're little beginners and they're in the tutor book and they do right hand and then they do left hand and then they do right and left hand and then they finally come together where they're actually doing it together. From that point I go, how about we memorise this piece? And so I hold up the book for them, you know, hold it in my lap and I say, go on, have a go. And of course a lot of them are too scared to try and I go, come on, you go, if you go wrong, just look across, I've got the book. And so I will hold the book up for them to the side of them and they'll play and often they can get at least two thirds of the way through and I'll go, yay, good job. And then we'll, you know, put it up in front of them and I'll say, just play the bit you don't know. Okay, good, start again and I'll take the book away from them. And then their job for that week is to go home and memorise the piece and they come back all, ooh -hoo. and of course I give them music money to do it. If they come back with it music and it done, yeah, awesome, here's $5 music money for you. Okay, so. They start doing that. So the bronze level one, which is something similar to this. Bronze level one, it says on the back, Piano Photo Memory Award, bronze level one, awarded by Mrs. C. Delaney. And you know, I don't put any date on it because sometimes kids are racing to get into, you know, like finalize their level. And if they miss, they can still do it, but they don't get their medal till the following year. So I don't want to put a date on it because that would be useless otherwise. So it's just no dates on it, but that's what it says on the back. So for a bronze level one medal, which is given at the concert, at the annual concert with all the honor and glory and you know presentation up on the stage, you have to do 10 pieces by memory and three of them have to be improvised. It means you've got to put a little introduction or an ending or take it up an octave or do a little glissando or something. You've got to do something in it. Um, and three of them have to be. So that's your 10. And when you do it, you've got to do it. You have to do it one after another. You can't do a couple this week at the lesson and then the next week. It's got to be, can you do that 10 straight in a row? Now, normally when I was teaching at school, if someone wanted to do it, I'd go, yep, and we'd do it in the lunch hour. They'd invite five friends into the music room. I could fit five, this is pre-COVID. Um, five students into the music room, and then they'd be told about audience manners, that you had to be quiet while they're playing and you know clap after each one, all that. So they had to be the audience, and then I had my student do their 10 pieces one after another. And at the end of it, 
um, the student was allowed to hand out a snake each to their audience as they left, right? So that was your 10. Now when you do the silver medal, which is something similar to this one, um, you had to do those 10 plus five more. And two of those had to be improvised. So you would end up with five out of 15 improvised. And you had to have a set of holidays in between. And yes, you had to play the bronze ones and the silver, the five silver ones, you had to play them. So you had to play 15 pieces in a row to get a silver medal, level one. And then along came gold. And gold is exactly the same with another five, except you've got to have, uh, let me think, three and two. You've got another two in the gold to be improvised. And so that's what it is across the board. And when you come to do a gold level, of course you get a trophy, ding, ding. And this one I've got is because a little girl was going for it for my concert at the end of last year and she would have been presented. It says Piano Forte Memory Award, gold level one, awarded by Mrs. C. Delaney. But unfortunately her, grandfather, her grandmother passed away and she just, you know, it all unraveled. So she's got it now, she hasn't now, but this will be presented to her at the 21 concert at the end of this year. So it's presented at the concert. Now that's level one. Level two. Level two, bronze, is you take five from the level one and you bring it across. Now, teacher has final say because you do not want them to bring little twinkle twinkle that they did back in level bronze to, over to their, you know, bronze level two. No, no. It's usually the five gold pieces come across or a mixture of the gold and silver pieces come across. They're the five favourites and they have to have three improvised plus add five more. So you've got 10, you've got five from the level one, five new ones, and out of that, three have to be improvised. If they've chosen to bring three improvised ones across, that's it, they've got improvised, it's all good. So that's your bronze level two, and then your bronze, uh, your silver level two is the same. You've got to have five improvised, etc., etc., and then you've got gold level two. So can you imagine when I'm listening to gold level two? I've got kids that are doing grade four, five, six, seven, doing 20 pieces. They might range in, you know, because in the beginning it's easy, you can get the two lower levels in the first year. But after that, like life happens. You've got exams, you've got a Steadfords, you've got like you're coming back after holidays, the big Christmas holidays where a lot of kids don't practice unless they've got an incentive scheme like I do um, or whatever. So you know what I mean? They don't tend to do two in one year as the levels get up. So by the time they're getting up to gold level two, they're doing all upper grade stuff. It's amazing. It's like, oh, you get this special concert every week. Do you know what I mean? It's lovely. And then finally we do platinum. Now I've had two students do platinum over the years I've done this. And platinum is you've got to bring 10 across from level two. You have to add another 10. 10 of them have to be improvised, embellished, improvised, whatever. And then once you can, you've got that program ready to go and there's 20, we arrange a concert. You get people coming in, like you invite an audience and they pay $5 at the door and that money goes to a charity of the child's choice. And I've had two, two kids do that with Platinum. Yeah. And just imagine, you know the biggest spin-off? I have had kids, how many times have you heard that kids, or even to yourself, and there's a piano and someone says, oh, can you play something? And you go, um, uh, no, look, sorry, I forgot my music. I haven't got my music. Now my kids, my kids don't say that. They go, sure, right? Because they've got to heap up their sleeve, even from the Little East. And I have had videos sent to me with my students on holidays. I've had them from Germany, the US, England, down in Melbourne, and there was one other place where they've sent me a video and they've found a piano. When you, you know how you sit, find these random pianos, it says play me, and they jump on and play. And it's awesome. And so I get all these, you know, and you know, thanks for helping me do memory, Mrs. D. And I had one particular child too who did her diploma and she went on to Bond University, got a scholarship to Bond University uh, to do commerce and law, she's a brilliant musician. But when she was in grade 12, she had to go and she was chosen, I think it's through the state schools, that, like a musical excellence program where they go, 
when they go away for a week. Anyway, so she went away because she was percussion, but they wanted people to do um, uh, piano as well. And they wanted a, one of the, there was about five of them who could do piano at that level, up at that level. And um, they asked, could someone play as a, as a feature in the concert, like a piano, they wanted a piano pianist to feature. And nobody except um, Isabel, nobody could play their pieces by memory. Do you see? And she said, Mrs. D, they said, can anybody play anything by memory? No. And, and she said, I'll put my hand up. And she said, I got to play two pieces. My Bach and one of her other modern pieces. She played Bach and, you know, a modern piece for her extra list. And she said it was awesome because she said nobody else could play by memory. So she said, I just wanted to tell you that, Mrs. D. So, you know, it's a good skill to have. I had another child do that. Her mother sent a video and said, look what Ella's doing. And they had to go and visit the mother's mother in an aged care home somewhere. And they were setting up to play bingo. You know how then everybody comes in. And there was a grand piano there in the common room and Ella just jumped on and started to play about half an hour before everybody came in and they're all coming in and she's entertaining the troops because she could play by memory she didn't have to have a music and my German kids they went over they were doing about grade three I think at the time there were two sisters and they went over to Germany to visit their um, grandparents over there because the mum is German and um, they had to go there was a music stall in the, in the same street where they were and they went and visited it. Now, you know when you go to a music store, the first thing that the store owner says is don't play on the piano. Don't play on the piano. They don't like kids like thumping on the piano, do they? So, of course, my kids could play their whole, whole program by memory. So it was eight pieces they knew by memory. Um, and they would go down and play. He, it, when he realised that they could play, yes, they could play, um, he said, you can come back any day you like. Mm -hmm. So they practised every day. They went into his store and played their pieces every day, so they were able to keep up their practice while they were gone. So it certainly is a is a huge um, draw card to keep the students doing that. And I think that's it for me. It is. We ask for questions now. Yes. Is there any questions? Yes. Um, I was just uh, with my studio. Um, I have the, the exams at my house. I noticed on here they didn't have any exact timings, like that you know, you've, got, you've got to have it between this so-and-so date and whatever. I was just wondering, how do you arrange, is there any strict timings that you have to have the exam? Not particularly okay. strict. Um, officially, we have three periods in Metropolitan, and that's May, June, August, September, October, November. The November can slip into December, and especially this year mm, did. Mm. My students always sit in September, the second last week of term three. Term uh, period three is the most popular for students. I have had people, the office ring me and say, I have one student who needs to sit, can they come to your house and will you examine them? The funniest one, I had a guy come from northern New South Wales, he was a drummer. He used my kit, but rode his motorbike up and had his symbols on his bag and arrived at my house and changed <laughs> all the symbols over. Uh, we're arranging for Leanne, for her students, because COVID's upset everything. Her school's just down the road from me. So we're looking at doing those in March. And so they are flexible if you request something out of period they can usually accommodate. But Tony if, is amazing. Yep, Tony, Tony yeah. When I first asked him if I could move my exams to early in the year rather than having it late, he said, yep, yeah, that we, we will work to accommodate that. Mm. Yep. So officially there are three periods and again they're in the back of the handbook mm. and it's May, June, but everyone sits in June, August, September, everyone sits in September and October, November everyone sits in November. Uh, that said, oh, I know what else we forgot to say. ANSCRA is so keen to have, could you put your hand up if you've never put anyone in for an ANSCRA exam? Okay, so quite a few people, very good. I put out a challenge at the end of every workshop. I challenge you all, take one student. More would be nice, but I want you to take one student and put them in this year for an answer exam. 
and I want you to see what their reaction is when they come back from the exam. Leanna's nodding vigorously. So I said to them, let's just do this for one year, guys, and see what happens, because we had a really awful year with the AMEB, not in terms of grading, but just in terms of the atmosphere within the exam wasn't very positive, and I had children coming out in tears and wanting yep. to quit, and it just wasn't what I wanted my students to experience. So I said to my old ones, let's just do it for a year, give it a try. If we don't like it, we can go back. Every single one came out and said, we are never doing another AMEB exam. That's it. Don't yep. put me in again. I'm not doing it. I'm doing ANSCA forever now. That's it. So when my parents, when because I work in a school, I often get parents um, whose children have been doing AMEB. I now tell them I don't do AMEB anymore because I feel that there is a better system for my students. Exactly. And it's accepted onto the QC just the same. That's exactly right. right. And exactly. I have had students who've grown up as ANSCA kids. They've never done anything else. They have been accepted into every tertiary music program in Queensland, a couple of them at Sydney Con as well. And I've had them accepted on piano, on singing and on percussion. So it is totally equal to other boards as far as accreditation and if they want to move on to tertiary music. We don't get many to move on to tertiary music, but pretty much all of mine that have, have grown up through ANSCA. But I would like that throw, to throw that challenge to you. Please put one student in and see what the difference in the child is when they come back and say what their exam was like. Mm. I also want to talk about Karen Henderson, one of our other examiners, when her little boy, I examined his, her little boy when he was about eight, he's now 30, and that's a long time I've been examining, and he is now an ANSCA teacher himself. He teaches woodwind, even though he's a very fine pianist and he loved doing exams. So he did the modern exam and the classical exams, and at that stage we only had the two, whereas we've got five streams now. And he said, Mum, Mum, can I do another exam? So she said, oh, well, all right. So she put him in for an AMEB exam. He came out, he said, I'm never doing another exam again. So that is the difference. So I would like to throw that challenge out. Please just try putting one student in. You won't look back. Cynthia? Okay, is there any more questions? Yes? Just regarding the theory exam, is it still just a sunny bank in the centre? Karen, can you answer uh, that? The south side is sunny bank and during COVID it was different. Did you put anyone in? No, not since about 2018 with the theory. Right. But I just wondered if there isn't a north side, because I don't think there was one before. No. So it's okay, so there was a little boy I took, I said, I'll take him rather than the parents having time off work in that. So if the supervisors there could be told occasionally there can be a major hold up going all the way from where we were kept in Stafford all the way to Sunnybank and it can be horrendous. I was more stressed out than the little boy. Yes. <laughs> and of course we got there 15 minutes late and he was only grade one so he did his exam fine but I think if the supervisors could be a little bit flexible and say Okay, you can have another 10 minutes. I think it would because be good. Yeah, anyway, for the yes. other exams, but they were very much. Um, can, can, I, can I talk to that? Yeah. When you are a supervisor, you get given um, strict regulations to follow, and the supervisor can't go out of that. It's not a thing where they can no. say, oh, yes, you can have a couple of minutes, yeah. because you are told that um, you can't let a child into the exam after 30 minutes. Yeah, after 30 minutes and no one can leave before 30 minutes is up That's so that there's no you know little clom flab outside the door this is no. what would as if that would happen but you know they have to be seen to be transparent over it and and that's probably why they couldn't give him extra time they, they're not they're not authorized to give him extra time yeah that said what I was yes. going to suggest mm. is for regional places like Cynthia was saying mm. you can have the we've done five workshops this week so I can't even remember if you said it today <laughs> but in regional areas mm. you can have the super oh that's right you did say about Janet so because you're north side and it is like another city Brisbane is so big mm. I can't see why you couldn't say look I'm north side I'm over an hour from the centre mm. and you could have, have something that on your at your side. studio yes. and get somebody else to be an external supervisor.
you know, get your next door neighbour and bribe them with cake, that's what I'd do. Uh, <laughs> but if you have a number of students, then ANSCA will pay for a supervisor to be in that centre. So whether you would be happy to have the child in your home doing it with one supervisor or I, the whole lower floor of my house is my studio. So I could easily, if I chose, I could easily set up desks all along. I mean, I've got a furniture fetish. I'm on a chair banned from my husband and I own eight dining room tables. It's really embarrassing. So I have no shortage of flat surfaces to put children. So you could in fact have it in your home and work it and get maybe a neighbour in and they could be paid to be the supervisor rather than doing that big mm. job. But again, the office is so approachable. Mm. All you've got to do is ask and they will usually find a solution. Can I, I perhaps, perhaps yes. say, say that because I'm not familiar with Brisbane. I just know where my sister lives and that's the end of that, right? So, and, and she's got a, I'll, if we're going anywhere, I'll say, how far is that in minutes? And she'll go, it's over at a suburb. And I'm going, no, mm -mm, how far is it in minutes? That's I need to work For like instance, that. my mother-in-law lives in Brisbane, but she's one and a quarter hours drive from my house. Yes. And she yes. thinks I can just pop in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what I'm suggesting is if you put theory students in, um, where it's got, because it's got the same thing you can write and say any request, just write and say you want a centre on the north side. I know now. Yeah, just well, right. That would be a, that apply to anybody. Yeah. yeah. Practical exams as well. Are we still a bit short on northern? Well, most of the when I've been examining on the north side, I normally examine at somebody's home, and a lot of teachers. When you open your studio for your own students, I have two full days of exams. So there really isn't room for anyone else. I have said to Sarah, and I have said to Mary Jane, if they want to send a couple of students to me, they're my friends, that's fine. We'll just move the walls sideways and get them in. But there's a box you can tick, and like Mrs Gaffney here has ticked the box, where she has said, yes, other people are very welcome to come to my studio so that she can make up the weight. She doesn't have three hours, but by ticking the box, I'll let other people come to my studio, that makes up the weight of the numbers. So you can either say, find me a place on the north side, or I will have them in my studio, but allow other students to come in as well. Hmm. I'm happy to have them, but hmm. you've been to my place. Yes. And I used to think when I moved from a house to a townhouse, it wasn't big enough into my little baby grand sort of there. But you were very kind and you said, I've been to smaller places than this. So I've been to shoe boxes. Your place was just fine. So I think uh, the examiners are lovely. The ANSCA head, head office attorney and the mm. other, they're also really lovely. So I can mm. vouch for that for people who don't know mm. about ANSCA. I definitely for it. Can I tell a quick Thank funny you. story about a shoebox I examined in? First time I went to a place that was just a drum studio, you see how much equipment Vlad and Lani have set up. As examiners, we have so many books we need. We have a table full of books. They gave me a chair. That's all I got. And I ended up saying, I think I need a bit more. So they found some drum cases and we made piles of drum cases and we improvised a desk. Evermore after that they found a desk for me but the first time I went there they didn't know. So I examined with stuff all around the floor writing on at the top of a Tom Tom case. It was hilarious. So yeah, I've been to much worse places. So is there any other questions? No? Well, if you want to come up and have a look at the books, you're more than welcome.